Church, welcome. I want to pray that this message is finding all of God's people well. I trust you're doing well. It's good to be connected once again this week on our Lord's Day as we have an opportunity to delve together into God's Word. It's been quite a treat to be able to launch this new uh, series through the book of 1 Peter. Um, I don't think I could stress it enough, but one thing I would want to just continue to encourage us to do so, we're about to jump into God's Word, um, through the week in between Sundays, if we could be reading through the entirety, it's not too much, five chapters, the entirety of, of the book of First Peter, uh, maybe a few times throughout the week, meditating upon it, I would even our, encourage our couples to have uh, Bible studies and discussions around uh, the messages that we have a chance to hear on Sundays, maybe a, a bit of a sermon-based discussion. Uh, our college students, our, our high schoolers, um, those people who have family with, with children, I think it would be a great way to be able to continue what we're doing here on a Sunday all throughout the week. It's what, what I found as I've practiced this for myself is that it only further cements God's truth within my heart and, and within my mind. I, I just can't get enough of God's Word. And I've, I count it a pleasure. It's really a pleasure and an honor uh, to be able to have the opportunity, week in and week out, spending my time pouring over Scripture, praying over God's Word, praying for God's people, looking to Him for a fresh message, um, a fresh word for, for His people. And I'm I just want to express my gratitude to God and His goodness. Um, I just want to testify to His grace in, in my life, and I'm just thankful that we have an opportunity to make much of Jesus by, by being able to have opportunities to live for Him, to follow Him, to pursue Him. This time of ours in God's Word isn't just some religious exercise. Um, this is our food. Uh, this is our sustenance. This is the way that we find ourselves uh, becoming nourished in, in our faith. This is what gets us through seasons like the one that we're still in. And I just want to encourage you along your walk with Jesus, um, stay the course and know that God is, is faithful in each of, of our lives. If you have your Bible, and I trust you do, let me invite you to turn with me to 1 Peter. Once again, 1 Peter in chapter 1. 1 Peter in chapter 1. And what we'll do is we'll read the first two verses for our time today. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. There Peter, writing to this church that's scattered, says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with His blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. I want to talk to us today a bit about our Christian identity. Um, that's what exactly the Apostle Peter is addressing at this point. This is a, a salutary remark at this point. The beginning of our New Testament epistles have the custom of beginning with a salutation. And this is Peter giving his salutation to this church that's not located at one particular place, but is actually scattered across a number of places across a, a vast region in Asia Minor of their day. This would be modern-day Turkey, if we were to try to pinpoint it. And Peter's addressing uh, these group of Christians. And what's significant about that is this. Part of the way that he addresses them indicates and communicates to us how we're supposed to view ourselves. The reason why Peter addresses his audience his readership, his recipients, the way that he does is because he wants them to view themselves a certain way. This has to do with identity. How do you view yourself? What do you view yourself in relationship to? 
If you don't have a solid answer to that question, that's fine. I'm sure, and I want to be confident that by the, by the time that we're done with our message today, you and I both will be able to have a firm answer and a grasp on our Christian identity. Why is a Christian identity so important? Because it gives me an idea and awareness of myself and of my relationship to God and my place in this world. It lets me know uh, what meaning is all about. Everybody, no matter who they are, whether they're a non-Christian or a Christian, is asking, whether they're coming out and saying it or not, they're asking certain fundamental questions. Everybody's looking for the answers to these questions. Where did I come from? Hmm? Why am I here? Right? What's, what's this all about? And where am I headed after all is said and done? Why am, wh where did I come from? Why am I here? What's this all about? And where are we headed after all of this is said and done? You see, th these are questions that have to do with your way and my way of viewing the world and our place in it. Okay, that's important. Christians should be able to have answers to all of these questions. There's actually a term for what I just described. It's called a Christian worldview. And as your pastor and as your fellow brother and as one who loves you dearly and wants to see all of God's people maturing in the faith, growing and establishing themselves in their relationship with Christ, we all need to have a solid Christian worldview. A Christian worldview I like to liken to a set of lenses. Some of you wear prescription lenses, and you might be able, you'll be able to follow along. And that is, when we wear glasses, we don't do so to look at, but rather we do so to look at everything else through or by. Similarly, a Christian worldview is a set of lenses that you intentionally put on. Not to look at, we're not staring at our worldview, but we're able to now look at everything else in our world through and by. If you don't have a Christian worldview, then you and I will not be able to have a Christian identity. And because the, this apostle, Peter, loves this church, cares for this church, has affection for this church, and wants to see this church mature, even in the middle of suffering and persecution, he wants to make sure that they're viewing themselves right. So, what's our worldview? Just what exactly is our, our Christian identity? Notice there how he addresses them. To those who are elect exiles of the dispersion. Let's stop right there. He uses the word elect. It's interesting, isn't it? First word he uses to refer to these people, some translations would go on ahead and have it translated as chosen, to, to the elect ones, to, to the chosen ones. What Peter at this point is referring to is a doctrine. A doctrine just means teaching. It's not a fancy word. It's just a big word. Doctrine means teaching. He's introducing a teaching of election and of being chosen. We'll see other places where this is mentioned. Along with referring to them as elect ones, you notice another E? He refers to them as exiles as well. Now, you may not notice anything about those two on the surface, but we're going to have an, a moment here to unpack that, and you'll see. He calls them elect exiles. Like Right after he says elect, he calls them exiles. Uh, on the surface, it looks like these are two polar opposite identities. They are identities. They're ways of viewing ourselves. Remember, we talked about Christian identity, but you almost think that these are two conversations that don't belong in the same room. You with me? You see, when I talk about being elect, I'm talking about my relationship vertically with God. When I talk about being in exile, I'm talking about my relationship horizontally with the world. The word exile can also be translated foreigner or stranger or pilgrim or sojourner. Okay? So here he calls these individuals elect exiles. One of the foundations of a Christian identity is to understand myself both in relationship to God and in relationship to the world. Here's the big idea. You and I will always struggle with figuring out what 
and where our place is in the world so long as God continues to struggle finding his place in our life. Notice what comes before exile, elect. So what Peter is trying to say is, before you try to figure out where do I belong in this world, what am I supposed to be doing here, and how am I supposed to be situated in this world, before I try to find answers to that question, I need to first get this question right. How's my relationship with God? A lot of the people that I encounter who struggle with knowing where their place is in the world are the same people who struggle with knowing where God's place is in their life. If you want to be able to make it in life and you want to be able to know how to be in this world, you've got to first have a right relationship with God. And so he calls them elect ones. Elect ones. This is beautiful. Um, In Ephesians, in chapter 1, which is important, it helps us unpack a little bit what this word has has to do. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. In verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now notice this, verse 4. Even as he, speaking of the same Father, God our Father, Even as he, the Father, chose us, same word, elected us. Even as he chose us in him, the him here is Jesus. So he chose us in Christ. Now notice, when did God elect us in Christ? It's right there. We don't have to make this up. Let's allow the text to speak for itself. Before the foundation of the world. For what purpose? That we should be holy and blameless before him in love. This is fascinating. So now we recognize that these people, these dear, beloved Christians that the Apostle Peter is writing to are ones that God elected, God chose, okay? God in his grace, God in his kindness, God out of his love, set his love upon. He chose them. He elected them, right? Maybe some of you, I remember um, I used to play an awful lot more than I do right now, uh, basketball. And we'd play pickup games at parks where it was known for getting good run, good pickup games. Well, it was kind of tough at some of these courts because uh, you had to have a pretty good game to be selected. And so you would have always a game going, but on the side, you would have a group of guys who are sitting out waiting for this game to come to an end. And there would be a captain for every new team of five. And you would walk around as soon as you show up and you say, uh, who has next? Anybody has next? No, he he has next. You got your five? I got my five already. All right, who has next after you? I do. You got your five yet? No, I don't have my five yet. I only have three. And then you're like, can I, can you pick me up? (laughs) And he'll need to get an answer from somebody who knows you to be able to know, can he run? (laughs) Because everybody who's assembling their team to be able to run next on the court wants to be sure that you got some A game. You have something to bring to this team. Otherwise, it's like, no, 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 no. you're dead weight. It's just, it's, we don't want you. Go with another team. You see, merit counts an awful lot in that context. God's not like that. <laughs> if God were like that, he'd be sitting around waiting an awful long time. It'd be him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit on the court. It wouldn't be a fab five. It would be a fab three if that was, is what it was all about. And I'm thankful to God for grace, right? Because God looked at us and he knew you're not going to be able to run on this court of life. You won't make it. You don't have what it takes. You're not it. I'm not. It's not because of me that God set his love upon me. It's because of him. This is humbling to know that it's grace. When we look around our society, so much of the way the world turns is based upon what can you deliver? What can you bring? How much of yourself can you show off? And only when you do so will anyone take an interest in you. But God says, look, I know no one else wants you, but I want you. I know everybody else has passed you by, but I'm not prepared to pass you by. You see, election has to do with God's commitment to you. Notice. Notice what he says here. I'll show you how I know that this is the case. It's before the foundation of the world. 
I mean, what were you doing so great and grand before the foundation of the world? Nothing. That's exactly the point. God wanted to demonstrate, look, I'm going to have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I'm going to show my love in such a way to make sure that this isn't for bragging rights on your part. I want to be able to demonstrate the greatness of my grace by how prepared I am to choose you, to set my love upon you, even before you do anything good or bad. This actually comes from somewhere in Scripture. And I want us to take a look at that in Romans, which also beautifully ties in with what we're looking at, not only in Ephesians 1, but also in 1 Peter in chapter 1. In Romans, in chapter 9, there, um, the Apostle Paul is writing about this same glorious truth. And he says there, he says there in the text, verse 10, Romans chapter 9 and verse 10. He says, and not only so, but also when Rebecca had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, verse 11, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of what? Election. There's the word again. Same, same word as we see there. We're talking about the same thing. Might continue not because of works. You see, God wanted to make sure that when salvation came to this world and that people entered into a relationship with him, this was going to be understood to be a relationship that was entered into not on the basis of works, but on the basis of grace, on the basis of God's doing, God's choosing. Why? So that God would get the glory. When you read your Bible carefully from cover to cover, Old Testament to the New Testament, one thing is going to be very clear to you and me, and that is God's about his glory. God's all about making his glory known, making his name known among the nations, and especially in the saving of a people for, for himself. You see, the, the world and the previous Neb, the previous me before Christ, would have looked upon this and, and would have been appalled. Why? Because those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Those who are in the flesh want to please themselves. My main aim is not want to, to want to give glory to God. My main aim in life and priority is to want to bring glory to myself, I'm afraid to say. And it took, actual, it took God transforming my heart. It took God saving me from my mess. It took God transferring me from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of his dearly beloved son. It took God passing me from darkness to light to be able to even value what we're talking about right here. And here, the Apostle Paul goes on and points out in verse 11 that God's purpose of election was to continue. And it wasn't supposed to be because of works, but because of him who calls. And so she was told, the older will serve the younger. You remember Jacob and Esau. As it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will, like I got me saved. I pulled myself up by my own spiritual bootstraps. I did this. I got me to where I am, right? I brought myself into heaven. No, 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 no. Notice what he's saying here. So that it depends. God's purpose of election was established for this purpose. So that it would no longer depend in anyone's mind or thinking on human will or exertion. Right? Become a Christian. No. But on God. What explains why you're a Christian today? Is what Paul is saying. Is it how bright you are? how much smarter and more clever you are to grasp the gospel than the next person? What explains why you treasure Jesus, love Jesus, are, are caught up with Jesus, value Jesus, and the next person doesn't? Is it, is it because 
you are, are more spiritual than the next person. You're less sinful or less of a sinner than the next person. And Paul says, no, it has nothing to do with anything. Stop looking to yourself is what Paul is saying. Stop looking to myself. Look to God. The answer that explains why you and I are alive today if you belong to Jesus. You're alive. You're not dead. Have you realized that? So many of us treat our Christianity like, I just turned over a leaf. That's it. I used to be Republican. I'm now Democrat. I used to be Democrat. I'm now Republican. I used to have this view. I now have that view. I just, I used to work here. Now I work here. It's like, no. (laughs) My fear is that when we don't appreciate God's role in our salvation, God's place in us becoming Christians at all, there's no room for gratitude. There's no room for for a thankful heart. There's no room for awe. There's no room for amazement and wonder. I mean, why would I be so amazed by me just making a decision? I mean, after all, all all I did was walk down an aisle. All I did was raise my hand when the preacher told me to raise my hand. All I did was sign a card. I mean, what's so amazing about that? Exactly. Which is why we have so much decisionism going on in our world today. So many people who the only thing they got going to their Christian name is a youth camp that they went to 30 years ago, a card that they signed, a Bible that they got from a counselor 20 years ago, but there's no life in them. They're still dead. They may have a Christian tattoo. They may have a verse somewhere on their body. They may loosely associate with the faith, but when God sees them, they're dead, spiritually speaking. God wants more. God wants more than just some loose outward association. That's cultural Christianity. God wants authentic Christianity. And Paul says here in Romans 9 that this election depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up that I might show my power in you, and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You remember? God's agenda is his glory. It's his name. His name is his glory. And he says there, so then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You see, we we look at something like this and we say, you know, that's just the apostles though. Jesus never talked in this way. Well, I wouldn't be too sure about that. Um, John chapter 6, last reference before we go back to 1 Peter. In John chapter 6, Jesus speaking, referring to himself as the bread of life, says there in John chapter 6 and verse 36, beginning in verse 35, Jesus said to them, He's speaking to his audience, these Pharisees, these religious leaders, his disciples by, he says to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Isn't that good news? Hallelujah. But I said to you that you have seen me, and you do not believe. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. You hear that? All that the Father gives to me will come to me, and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And what is the will? This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose how many of all that the Father gave to Jesus, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. You see, friends, this election is not something to fight. This isn't something, no, no, no. You know why Peter is sharing this with these young Christians who are scattered, experiencing persecution and suffering is because no one has chosen them in this world. No one has seen them. No one has valued them. No one has set their love upon them. The only thing that's been their experience is to be chased away from one town to the next 
only to be reminded, not welcome. Only to hear from the words of the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, God's chosen you. Somebody needs to hear that today. God's elected you. God's chosen you before the foundation of the world. Just like Jeremiah, I knew you before you were even in your mother's womb. And what did he do with Jeremiah? He set him apart. How do you do that? I don't know. I don't know how you do that. God does though. And that's all that matters to me. But not only does he call them elect, he also calls them exiles. (laughs) Chosen by God. I know my relationship between myself and God vertically. And now I can know my relationship horizontally to the world. You see, if you want to get to that place where you know your relationship to the world and what that is, you need to first know what your relationship with God is. Here he calls them exiles, wanderers, sojourners, pilgrims, foreigners. That's their place. Literally, they're displaced. Literally, they're in areas of the world of their day, Asia Minor, that they can't honestly call home. Maybe some of you are in that exact place. You feel like that in many ways. Some of you, perhaps spiritually, maybe with what's going on in our world, wherever you happen to be tuning in from from the world, you may look at your culture, you may look at your society, you may look at your generation, you may look at what your children are growing up to inherit, and you're wondering, I'm not too sure I recognize this world. Some of you are a lot older than the rest, and you're wondering, this is not the world I grew up in. Others of you are are just now getting married, and you're just now beginning to have children, and there's fear, and there's panic, and there's worry, and there's anticipation within your hearts as young parents, and you're thinking, how am I going to do this? Do you see this world as your home? Peter is referring to them as exiles, not as something that's bad, but as the very way that they should, because they're now chosen, see themselves. You see, the person who's truly an elect of God, truly chosen of God, which means a Christian, understands that this world is not their home and that they're just, as the whole old hymn puts it, just a passing through. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're exiles. So let me ask you this question. Do you see this world as, as home? If Jesus were to come today, or you were through any sort of circumstances, go to be with him today. You see that as a bummer? Is that a downer? Would you see Jesus and be like, God, I I still got a bucket list. I haven't got anywhere near to. Please, not now. Or is there something within you that longs for another world? Now that you have been chosen by God, that you belong to God. Some ask the question, is there a place to be patriotic? Is there a place to be able to, to be a lover of your country or wherever you may be, whether you're in Australia or Africa or America or or Canada, is it right? Christians often ask this question. Is it okay to be a faithful Christian and at the same time have a love for culture or a love for the world or a love for my nation? It depends. It depends. I don't think it's so much whether or not you should or shouldn't. The question is, in all of your patriotism, in all of your nationalism, in all of your love for whatever part of the world you happen to be in, do you know when that love crosses over to where it now jeopardizes your commitment to your faith? You see, at the end of the day, regardless of the love that we have for our country or for our culture, our primary loyalty should be to God and to his kingdom. Paul says in Philippians in chapter 3 and verse 21, but our citizenship is where? 
not here on this earth. It's in heaven. And from it, we await who? A savior who will transform this lowly body to be like that, which is his glorious body. You see, our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. That's where we await our savior from. That's where we long to be. Remember what Paul says in Philippians 1, verses 19 and following. He says, I'm torn between two, between a dilemma, having a desire to, de- to depart and to be with Christ, which is what? Far better. He calls that better. Where's Christ? Not here. He calls that better. Nevertheless, to remain with you is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I recognize that I'll remain with you all for your joy in the faith. So we realize that if we are still here, even after we've entered into a relationship with Jesus, we recognize we're here for a purpose. And that purpose is tied to who God is, which is why you and I need to first understand our relationship to God, hence elect, before we could understand our relationship to the world, hence exiles. A lot of the people who struggle, whether you're the kind of person who is for culture or against culture, are the kind of people who haven't started where they should have begun. And Peter, writing to this young, these young Christians, includes both elect and exile to help them to be able to understand their faith in culture, their faith in their country, their faith wherever they may be. Let me see. Let me see. Because there's no guarantees for us here on this earth. You may love it right now, but any number of events could transpire in one decade, one generation, that, that could make it so such that the world that you now love will not be the world that you thought would be. What do you do then? Peter knew this to be the case with them and the world of their day and how it was on its way to crumbling. And he says, look, I don't want you to set your hope in this place. I want you to set your hope on your God who chose you and set his, his love, his affection, his heart toward you. Because no matter whether you may be home or whether you may be away, because of your will or against your will, you know who you are. A lot of people's identity is tied to a, a time in history. Some people's identity is tied to a geography. Other people's identity is tied to certain groups of people. What happens when any one of those things are stripped from you? Do you still recognize yourself? You should be able to if, if your identity is tied and anchored where it belongs. Peter wants it to be. And so he calls them here and he says to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. These are a number of regions, a number of areas. And the dispersion, the same word where we get a diaspora from. Some of you have been dispersed. Some of you are where you're at, not because you necessarily wish to. I know there are a lot of people who have moved to the Dallas-Fort Worth area from other places of California and other parts of the country because of the economy. Uh, There's uh, others of you who have moved to different regions of Arizona or other places where um, it's because of the different season of your life that you're in. Um, some move to certain parts of the Dallas-Fort Worth area because I used to be single. That part of the town worked for me. Now that I'm married and we're kind of thinking about having children, this part of the town works for us. There are any number of things that result in people's dispersion like these individuals. And regardless of the location, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, you name it, the point is this. Their faith got them where they were. This isn't uh, the result of what was on their bucket list. Oh, I sure hope to go to Cappadocia. Yay, thank you, Jesus, for answering my prayer. No, it's persecution. There is suffering going on. They're standing up for Jesus and not backing down. And guess what happened? They got kicked out. They got displaced. You know people like that? I have family members who had to grow up for a season of their life under communist regimes where the churches during their day had to go under. And they had to meet privately and quietly 
just to be able to express their faith and exercise religious freedom. They don't enjoy the kind of freedoms that you and I do. And once the opportunity arose for them to be able to leave their land when things weren't getting any better, but only worse, they did so. And they came to places like America. Why? Because they believed in something so much that they were prepared to relocate even from a country that they loved. But because of the direction that it turned, their main priority trumped their loves. And that was their faith, their values. And they wanted to make sure that there was a place that they can take themselves and their families to where they would be able to raise their children up in the ways of the Lord. Many people are dispersed for different reasons. Here's my point, and here's the big idea. I hear a lot of talk about, I want to travel, or I want to, I want to move from this place to another. I, I notice a number of people, depending on their age groups, have a tendency to be in one place, but, but not long, and then all of a sudden move again. And to stay put. It doesn't take much to relocate just like that. And I'm not too sure it always has to do with the fact that God's calling me, that I have a burden from heaven, that it's his kingdom that I'm trying to put first in my life. And as a result of that, that's why I need to go to where I feel like I'm moving. No, it has more to do with me and what I want to get out of my life and what I see as a benefit over there. That, that's not what we have going on here in this passage. I'm sure they had their own preferences, but they set their preferences aside for what? For Jesus. You see, remember, we're talking about Christian identity. And part of understanding your Christian identity is understanding that when you come to Christ, you're on mission. God's a missionary God. And therefore, if you belong to him, God's people are missionary people. Jesus said in John 20, 21, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. That's what we need. We need people who are prepared to put the mission ahead of their own personal preferences. The reason why we're not getting the gospel to where it needs to get, and we're not penetrating and reaching areas that we need to be reaching is because everybody is focusing, so many give far more attention to what they want out of life than asking the question, God, where do you want me? Where can I plant myself? Where can I best flourish? Where can I be a faithful witness to you? Where can I be the brightest light? That's the question we need to be asking. And guess where it got these people? Cappadocia, Bithynia, Asia, Galatia. Why? Because of the mission. Question, where are you right now? Location-wise, where are you? And how'd you get there? Is it the gospel? Is it God's mission? Where are you working? What are you involved in? Where are you prepared to move? Where are you thinking about moving? And what's driving that? What's motivating that? Is it the mission? Right? I'll get sometimes college students who come to me and say, oh, I'll be gone in a month, pastor. Like, really? Where? Well, I'm going to school. Really? Where? Oh, it's about it's miles and miles away. It's across the country. Real, my goodness. When is this going to happen again? In about a month. I'm excited. Have you prayed about it? Have you thought through it? Is it God's will? Because if it is, I want to praise God together with you. Is there a church you found? Is, have you looked equally into how you can flourish spiritually there? Not just what sort of degree you can obtain there. You see, as Christians, remember the worldview I talked about. We have a lens. And we have an identity. And we're supposed to see not only ourselves, but our relationship to the world through that lens. And Peter wanted to make sure that no matter how many things were outside of both his and their control, that if he could, he would have done something about he wanted to focus on what he can still do something about, and that is encourage their identity in Christ. And he calls them exiles of this dispersion. He says, verse 2, it's according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Same thing, this being chosen, this being elected before the foundations of the world, where God 
the Father gave me to the Son and where I have the hope of being raised one day is according to the foreknowledge of God. That word, the foreknowledge of God, has to do with the forelove of God. God set his love toward me well before I ever came into the picture in time. This isn't God seeing me from afar. No, no, no. This is God setting his heart, his affection, his love toward you and toward me. And he says there, it's all according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. I want you to see something. I want you to see the Trinity all here. The foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of what? The Holy Spirit for obedience to who? Jesus Christ. Father, Spirit, Jesus Christ. They say it takes a village to raise a child. It takes the Trinity to save a child, right? It took the whole Trinity. The Father from eternity past planned your salvation. Ephesians 1, 4. The Son in time accomplished your salvation. The Holy Spirit went forward to apply that salvation, which was planned before the foundation of the world and accomplished in time and in history by the Son so that you might be able to be a child of God and so that God might be your Father. This is good news. This is encouraging news to know that you and I, church, we have a father. We have a father who loves us. We have a father who has set his love toward us as a seal. And he says there, because some people think, wait a second here. I mean, if, if God, how do I know I'm the elect? <laughs> I get that question a lot. How do I know? Because uh, I got a question. Um, can I ask you? Okay, <laughs> Sure. Well, I've, I've repented and trust, trust in Jesus Christ. And I wanted to know, how would I know, though, that I'm the elect? Well, you just answered your own question. <laughs> right? You've trusted in Jesus Christ. Well, well, doesn't God choosing us take away from and discount us exercising our will toward him in obedience? Apparently, Peter has no problem talking about election and what? It's right there. Obedience in the same passage. I never knew that you had to reconcile friends. The only time you have to reconcile is when you don't have friends and there's, there's a gap. There's, there's a chasm. There's no chasm here. You see, they're a friend to each other. And here, what do we see? The sanctification of the Spirit. This refers to the Holy Spirit working within us and in our lives and in our hearts. But he goes on and he says that it's for obedience to Jesus Christ. This is important here in this passage. I want you to get this because notice, notice, God is all about obedience to Jesus. There's no such thing as, I mean, I'm hearing talk from time to time about growing number of people who call themselves Christians but don't have to give their life over to obedience. You won't find that in the Scriptures. Here, Peter is not only talking about our Christian identity, but the importance of us being obedient to Jesus Christ. You see, when God saves me, when I trust in Jesus I believe in him, not just as a savior, but also as Lord. You see, there's this popular thought that can I just accept Jesus today as my savior? And then at some point down the road, maybe 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road, when I get around to it, I'll accept him as Lord. It's like, no, no, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. In Romans, in Romans, in chapter five or chapter 10, there's something very important there that we see laid out for us in Scripture. There in Romans chapter 10, we're told that it's, notice here, I want you to listen to this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is what? Lord. 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This isn't someone 10 years down the road after being a Christian. When we come to faith in Christ, we come to him as a savior who saved us from sin and from Satan and from death and the wrath of God. But we also come to him as Lord. In other words, he's now the master of my life. My life is in his hands. He leads, he shepherds, he guides, he shows the way. I don't call the shots, he does. I'm joined to him. And apart from him, I can't bear any, any fruit. He's Lord. And here, Peter is saying that we have been called to what? For obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. This is beautiful. Peter's drawing back upon the Old Testament in Exodus 24 for a reason, where we see the sprinkling of blood along with the obedience together. This is going to encourage somebody's heart. Some of you are overwhelmed with the fact that you look at yourself, you look at your spiritual life, you view yourself, and then you view yourself in relationship to God, and you're thinking, I just feel like a sad case. Honestly, I feel dirty. I can't shake my past, whether that's my recent past or my distant past. I just feel so dirty. You know, what, you know what Peter says here, inspired by the Holy Spirit? Sprink for sprinkling with his blood. You know what that means? Sprinkling, cleansing, purifying. When you come to Christ, not only does God accept you in his son, not only does God pay the penalty of your sins, not only does he remove your sins as far as the east is from the west, not only does he adopt you, not only does he regenerate you and change your heart, from the inside out, guess what? He sprinkles you with his blood. He cleanses you. What that means is when God sees you, when your father looks at you, child of God, he sees you clean. Some of you have not seen yourself clean in a long time. I'm imagining that even as I speak these words, you, you, you're having a hard time receiving it because all you can do is focus upon the things you've said, the places you've thought, and the things you've done. And you can't get past it. I'm here to tell you, you can. But the only way you can get past it is through the blood of Jesus. Jesus' blood, friend, cleanses us from all sin. The Bible says if you confess your sins, God is faithful and he's just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Peter's looking at this church right here and he says, God chose you. God set his heart upon you. God elected you. God foreknew you for what purpose? To cleanse you with his son's blood. You see, the blood of bulls and goats in the past used to have to be offered up again and again and again by the Old, Old Testament people of God. This was a practice that they had to do over and over and over again. And it never really solved anything because ultimately it pointed to something that was going to happen in the future. And that has to do with Jesus Christ. You see, the Bible says that Jesus' blood was shed once and for all. Once and for all. What the blood of bulls and goats was incapable of doing, Jesus' blood did once and for all. It's the precious blood, friend, which cleanses you and me. It cleanses our minds. It cleanses our hearts. It cleanses our consciences from anything filthy, from anything vile, from anything that robs us of being able to enjoy intimacy with God, fellowship with God, communion with God. And I don't want you to miss out on this. If the truth be told, there's a good number of you Whereas you're looking at yourself, it's been an awful long time since you've had the chance to walk with God in this sort of way. You see, the way we relate to God is not in and of ourselves; It's in and through Jesus Christ. And I want you to invite you back to the first things. Could it be that the reason why you're not enjoying a clean conscience between God 
in others is the fact that you're trying to relate to God and to others outside of Jesus, when the only way we can relate both to one another or to God is through Jesus? And could it be that today is that day where you can rededicate yourself to Christ, rededicate yourself to a Father that loves you? This is where your identity is going to begin. You got to first understand yourself in relationship to God and recognize God has chosen me. Some people think, well, what is this going to cause? I'll tell you what's going to cause. When I know that my childhood status and my being a Christian has less to do with me and more to do with God, you know what that produces? We got a word for it. Humility. That's what it produces. Why? Because I, I got no bragging rights, no swagger status. I can't pop my collar. I can't say anything about what I've done. I did it my way. What I've done to be able to get myself into this relationship. It's all him. It's all about him, which is why the songs that I sing have to do with him. The messages that I preach have to do about him. The life that I want to live has to do with him. And the way I, I relate to other people has to be about him. No, friend, election produces humility. You see, is there humility in your life? When you look at other people who are still out and about doing their thing, do you look at those kinds of people and do you say, look at them? Or are you someone who's moved with pity and compassion? You see, because at the end of the day, if this message is really getting to you, you know, you know what should become increasingly apparent? It's this. There's virtually no difference between me and the next man. What explains me as a Christian and them as not has less to nothing to do with me, and it has everything to do with God's grace. I'm just, when I see people who represent all sorts of different lifestyles in our world throughout my week, in my city, I don't look around at people and say, how could they? What are they doing? What's going on with these folks? No, I see myself in everyone. I recognize but for the grace of God, go I. I want to encourage you right now. If you want to know something of this humility, it's going to begin by us approaching this God right here at this close. And say, God, help me. I want to see you right. I want to understand my relationship with you better. And I really do want to know how I'm supposed to be existing in this world. I'm kind of comfortable. I'm not too sure I see myself as an exile. This is, I'm not too ready to want to leave this place. I want you to really bring all of that to God and say, God, make my citizenship where it belongs. Help me, Lord God. He will. He will. Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you right now as ones who have been chosen by your grace, loved upon by your grace, overwhelmed by your grace. Lord, we recognize what we deserve outside of Jesus. Nevertheless, you chose to show your mercy toward us anyhow. And for that, we give you all the glory. God, we pray, Lord, that you would situate us in this world in a way that brings you glory. God, thank you for making us exiles. Thank you for giving us a heart for home, for heaven, for a, for, for a citizenship that belongs in heaven. Thank you for putting your mission heart within each and every one of us. God, we want to be on the move so long as we're here. We want to be about your agenda. We want to be about your purposes so long as we are here. Lord, do this. Lord, accomplish this. And Father, I pray, Holy Spirit, just as we saw, go on to sanctify us, go on to shape us, go on to conform us into the image of Jesus. Take us from glory to glory, I pray. Father, I pray that we not be stagnant in our Christian life, but that we go onward and forward. Help us, Lord God, as soldiers of Jesus Christ to march forward triumphantly with your word in our hearts, with our witness in our mouth, Lord God. May we be bold. May we be public. May we be unashamed for Jesus again. Lord, I thank you for your gospel. 
I thank you for the hope that you've set upon people's hearts. We thank you that we're here not alone. You've given us your presence. You've given us your people. And now, God, I pray that as we conclude this time of ours and have to live this out, be with us. Cleanse me. Cleanse us. May the blood of Jesus be adequate, be sufficient, be enough for each and every one of your children. May no one have to any longer look at themselves as though they're filthy, as though they're dirty, as though they're basically who they always once were. But if anyone is in Christ, they're a new creation. Old things have passed away and the new has come. And the blood of Jesus, sprinkled, cleansed, has accomplished all of that. God, we thank you. We bless you. We give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.